Thank you, Mayur, for your kind invitation. And the topic given to me is the pharmacotherapy for type for pre-diabetes. And this is what the people say: the diabetes become an epidemic, especially when people are using too much of spam and cookies from the internet. And that's the reason why we are seeing the explosion of diabetes globally. And this is the definition of pre-diabetes, which is also called intermediate hyperglycemia where the blood glucose is more than the normal levels, but lower than the cutoff values for the diagnosis of diabetes. It was first described in 1956 in connection with GDM, where pre-diabetes was detected and described, sorry. And here you can see the natural history of diabetes. Before the onset of diabetes, there's a long phase of pre-diabetes where the intervention at this time can be any useful in reducing the incidence of type two diabetes is that today's question. And we can see here, and that is a prandial sugar which rises first, and then the fasting sugar rises subsequently. And if you look at the definitions of the ADA and ACE are identical. Both say that between 100 to 125 is the impaired fasting, and two hours post-challenge between 140 to 199, and even within 5.7 to 6.4. The ACE includes the metabolic syndrome also, by diagnosis by the National Cholesterol Education Program, is also included as part of pre-diabetes by the ACE. So this is about statistics. And in India, we see about 36.5 million patients of impaired glucose tolerance. And in USA, it is 35.8 million people with impaired glucose tolerance. And what's the worrying part of the story is one third of the IGT for an age group of 20 to 39 years and half of the IGT fall around the age of 50 years. So the younger generation is getting affected, which quickly gets converted to diabetes. And that's the cause of concern. Now the pre-diabetes is then very critically looked by the ACE uh, guideline. And it says in the position statement that the clinical intervention of the pre-diabetes is very essential. That has to be kept in mind. And the adiposity-based chronic disease management is also important. And therefore, redefining the context of pre-diabetes as the evidentiary structure of dysglycemia-based chronic diabetes. And here what they're saying is that there's a continuum with the genome, the epigenome, and the environment, which goes to the phase of a pre-diabetes, which is primarily in in treat, uh, prevention with the insulin resistance as a basic criteria. And then you have the pre-diabetes as the biochemical and the cardiometabolic risk factors, eventually stepping into type 2 diabetes. And as for the ACE, when we treat patients of diabetes, we are treating at the level of tertiary prevention rather than treating early. So therefore, there's emphasis that you should treat these patients earlier rather than waiting for them to get into diabetes phase. And therefore, the framework of the dysglycemia based chronic disease begins with stage one with the molecular risk factors, stage two with biochemical cardiometabolic risk factors, and the biochemical disease in type 2 diabetes, and eventually the complications of type 2 diabetes. The natural history of prediabetes is that 22% undergo remission. This is a study which looked at 9 and 18 patients of prediabetes, out of which 13% progressed, and this is much higher in this country as we have studied from the CURE trial from Chennai, where the conversion rate is pretty higher than 13%, and 23% died because of various complications of pre-diabetes, could be contributed by obesity and heart disease and hypertension and peripheral neuropathy. The low systolic blood pressure, absence of heart disease, and a weight loss promoted these patients to normal glycemia, while obesity accelerated the development of diabetes. If you look at the guidelines by the ACE, which talks about the hyperglycemia management in, in pre-diabetes, where they said use of metformin and acarbose as the low risk metabolic condition medications versus the TZDs and GLP receptor agonists consider with caution, but not forgetting the other factors like dyslipidemia and hypertension as well, which requires attention in the interest of time I am restricting my discussion only for the glycemic control. So we are aware of this, the uh, Diabetes Prevention Program published in the February 2002, which looked at three arms of placebo, metformin, and lifestyle for a period of four years 
and we saw that lifestyle brought the reduction of diabetes by 58%, whereas metformin reduced the incidence of diabetes by 38%. So therefore, we had this uh, aspect of using metformin as a part of treatment in patients of pre-diabetes. And the metformin is recommended by the European and American guidelines to treat patients of pre-diabetes. This is a Chinese study which looked at the use of metformin, which reduced the incidence of diabetes by 38, 31%. And if you look at the Indian study, the reduction of diabetes was quite less, it was just 26% and with metformin. And if you use metformin lifestyle, it is just 28%. But all the same, that metformin can be used to treat patients of pre-diabetes to reduce the incidence of well, proceeding to diabetes. The alpha glucosidase inhibitors uh, were critically looked in in this particular study, which had 1,400 plus patients. And this is a three years duration of trial which showed reduction of new onset diabetes by 36%. Mind you, these are the patients who had impaired glucose tolerance, which was seen with the giving 75 grams of glucose and showing the sugar values postprandially more than 140, but less than 199. And there it showed reduction of diabetes by 36%. And interestingly, it also showed reduction of myocardial infarction by significant number with a p-value of 0.2 and also the CV event reduced significantly with a p-value of 0.3. So the carbos came as a big promise in patients of IGT, especially reducing the ischemic burden. The pyoglitazone also was used by Dral de Franzo in the ACNO trial, and which had roughly 500 plus patients. And this study was carried on for a period of 46 months. And when you see that at the end of this trial, 72% of the patient did not progress to type 2 diabetes, and 42% of the patient who were treated by glitazone were reverted to normal glucose tolerance when you give this particular molecule. So this molecule brought a great change in the prevention of developing type 2 diabetes, and therefore, it became a really a molecule of a great importance. So not to forget that this tablet also does cause increased weight gain but then the incidence of diabetes was reduced significantly. Same is true with the DREAM trial, which looked at more than uh, 5,000 patients. And here you can see the reduction in the onset of diabetes was reduced by 60%. And this effect was more pronounced in patients who are overweight rather than underweight patients. So therefore, more the patient with obesity, more has the effect of this particular molecule reducing the diabetes to the tune of 40, uh, 60%. And this is very obviously seen in this particular trial. And eventually on the based on this trial itself, when the Steve Nissens talked about the new incidence of in myocardial infarction, in these patients where the dream became a nightmare, where he said there's an increased incidence of acute myocardial infarction in those patients who received rosiglitazone. Zendo's trial, again, looked at patients around uh, 7,000, uh, more than 3,000 patients, sorry. And here, these patients were given 120 milligram three times a day of orally stat. And 20% of these patients had impaired glucose tolerance and 80% of the patient had a normal glucose tolerance. If you look at all patients at the bottom of the curve, you can see the reduction of type 2 diabetes by 37.3%. But those patients who had impaired glucose tolerance and where the drug was given besides lifestyle modification, you got reduction of new onset diabetes by 45%. So therefore, therefore preventing the weight gain also improved the onset of diabetes in these patients along with lifestyle modification. The DPP-5 inhibitors are also used. There are two studies which looked at it. The first study looked at critically ill patients, 71 individuals with acute coronary syndrome. This is a European site study which looked at using the uh, cetagliptin in these patients and showed a reversal of diabetes to some extent. And there's one more study which looked at 242 patients of impaired glucose tolerance were randomized to receive either 25 or 50 milligrams of cetagliptin over a period of eight weeks, significantly reduced the area under curve of glucose over, of these patients after eight weeks of therapy, suggesting these drugs can also be used as a kind of a drug to reduce the progression of type 2 diabetes. Scale study, which Dr. Rajiv was talking about, had more than 3,000 patients. Uh, in the scale study, large number of population were women, about 
and 61% of these patients had pre-diabetes. When you give them liraglutide at the end of 56 weeks, roughly about a year or so, the weight reduction was about 8.4 kilograms in these patients. And you can also see the significant reduction of diabetes, pre-diabetes to diabetes in these patients over a period of one year. So therefore, weight reduction was an important contributor in all these studies which looked at the reduction of the uh, incidence of diabetes. This is one more study, which is actually a, a study which was the double blind randomized controlled trial looking at 464 individuals from 19 sites from the Europe with a BMI of 30 to 40, where liraglutide was used and the active comparator was early stat here. And what you see in these patients, these patients were followed up for a period of one year. And what did you see? 20 weeks. Uh, 20 weeks. And what did you see here? And they're using 2.4 or 3 milligrams. The two-year prevalence of pre-diabetes decreased by 52% in the metabolic syndrome. So group A was the metabolic syndrome. Group B was pre-diabetes and 59% compared to the only stat group. So therefore, there was a reduction both in the metabolic syndrome and in diabetes in these patients when you use Again, liraglutide, this is the study which looked at the using either 2.4 or 3 milligrams, and this had large number of population just contributed by women. Again, the Carl Leroux tried the same molecule, 3 milligrams of liraglutide, and showed weight reduction of 4.6 kilograms, and showed the normal glycemia in the liraglutide group to the, in 66% compared to 36% in the in, in the placebo group, and 3% of the individuals in the liraglutide group versus 11% in the placebo group developed diabetes by the end of the trial, again suggesting that liraglutide did have impact in reducing the conversion of diabetes, pre-diabetes to diabetes. Here we have the DAPA trial. This is a pooled analysis of DAPA CKD and DAPA heart failure trial, which looked at more than 4,000 individuals, up to which 1,400 belong to DAPA CKD and 2,600 from DAPA heart failure. The a combo therapy in patients to, develop, to see the development of pre-diabetes to diabetes. And here you can see that the development of pre-diabetes to diabetes was quite less when you use this molecule in the combination therapy. The use of insulin therapy, the early insulin treatment to prevent cardiovascular disease in a pre-diabetes to over-diabetes. And of course, we know that the use of diabetes insulin is very important in diabetes. In pre-diabetes also, the insulin promotes mobilization of free fatty acids and therefore prevents deposition of ectopic fat. And the origin trial was actually looking at this hypothesis. And what you see in origin trial, conversion from IFG, IG to, to, type, to diabetes was reduced significantly by 28% with the significant p-value. So if even intensive insulin therapy or insulin therapy in the early phase of pre-diabetes can also have reduction in the onset of diabetes. The probiotics have been always interesting in the field of medicine. And this is again a study which looked at using probiotics in prevention of diabetes. The data is still not out. And here are the 100 people who received probiotics, 100 in the placebo group. And the, this is a Chinese study. And the primary outcome is the development of type 2 diabetes. The data is still not ready, but most probably the data is likely to be in favor of using these, one, these uh, pre probiotics also to treat patients of pre-diabetes. So these are the data which I showed you about metformin, the carbos, pyogenetes, or luziglitazone. Only stand, there are some antipsychotic medications and bariatric surgery, which also develop, which also reduce the development of diabetes from pre-diabetes. This is the meta-analysis which published in BMJ Research which looked at all the molecules which said, and every molecule has the point estimate before the line of unity. Again, saying that these drugs have been effective. This looked at 
21 trials, more than 8,000 patients, lifestyle modification plus drugs. Of course, lifestyle intervention seems to be at least as effective as the drug treatment. So therefore, these are the, some of the aspects of looking at these drugs. The age recommendation for therapeutic targets in prediabetes is to consider the pharmacological therapy in high-risk patients. You can use the drug in patients who have IFG or IGT or both or metabolic syndrome, worsening glycemia with the cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, history of gestational diabetes or PCOS. In those patients, it's indicated to use these drugs. Lipid, of course, is important to treat lipid and target lipid LDL below 100, blood pressure below 130, and antiplate therapy with a low-dose aspirin recommendation for all patients with prediabetes unless there's a contraindications. And there are no therapies approved by FDA for prevention of diabetes as yet. And now we know that we have been heading for a disaster. What we can do, we still have prevention as the best method to have the onset of diabetes in patients with pre-diabetes. So therefore, diabetes prevention program will always score above all the medication therapy, but still there are some of the options available in certain patients where this can be offered as a form of therapy. With that, I thank you very much.